Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Praise the Lord. Um, I just want to welcome everybody to the Christian Resource Center where we're leading God's people to the way to be saved. I want to welcome everybody in person and I want to welcome everybody oh, that's online joining us. Uh, this is our fourth session of Christian Maturity. And before we get started, I would like to just lead us in prayer. We got some people that's coming in. Um, but Lord, again, we just thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for just giving us another day for your grace upon grace, Lord. We thank you for your word that sharpened into any two-edged sword. And Father, we thank you for the church. We thank you for your truth and that the church is the pillar of truth. And so, Father, we pray that as we dissect this truth in regards to just Christian maturity, Father God, how we can continue to be sanctified by your word. Lord, I just pray that you will soften our hearts to receive this word, that your, uh, the, the seed of the gospel will land on fertile ground. And so, Father, we just pray that you will have your way, Lord, that we will understand what it means to become more like Jesus Christ, to follow him in discipleship and to encourage and inspire Christian maturity. So, Lord, your word says that it is your desire for us as a body of Christ Father, to um, become the mature body of Jesus. And so, Lord, help us to do that uh, by not only increasing in the knowledge of your word, but also by applying these teachings. So, Father, we just thank you so much for another night. We thank you for this session. We pray that the Holy Spirit will just lead us and guide us during this hour in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Come on down. The price is right. God bless you. God bless you. And so um, welcome to our Fourth session, making one disciple at a time. I am your host, David, and um, God is so amazing. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And you guys are just on time. And um, again, we're gonna just, what we're gonna start off here is we're gonna go over what we learned so far. And it's amazing how much we have been able to learn just in three sessions alone. And when I was just putting it all together, I'm thinking to myself, Wow, we've covered a lot of material, believe it or not. And um, we covered our program philosophy in the very beginning. We'll go over again Ephesians 4 for purposes of retainment. We talked about what it means to be a Christian. Now, some of this may be trivial, uh, but for those new believers that are just coming to the faith, hello, hello, uh, they may not understand all that is involved when it comes to following Jesus. Uh, we talked about the goal of every Christian. What spiritual goals are we supposed to have oftentimes we don't grow and we become mature because we don't have any spiritual goals we have nothing to look forward to we have no objectives when it comes to our faith our walk with the lord jesus christ uh we did we discuss how to become rooted every goal for every christian should be to become rooted to become established to become firm in the faith we review what it means to repent and we'll talk about repentance a little bit more today uh, we talked about what it means to deny yourself pick up your cross and follow jesus we displayed a road map that gives you an idea of what that christian journey should be like for you and how you can become a mature believer we talked about uh, we handed out a reflection assessment and i hope that you guys had an opportunity to go over that if you didn't receive one let me know we'll get you a copy of that but this will just kind of help you identify some trends that uh, occur that have existed in your family that may have been preventing you from handling certain things that you've been carrying around for quite some time i know i had a lot of baggage a lot of junk in my trunk, okay? Uh, we reviewed the parable of the sower. We defined being rooted. We talked about the importance of examination, devotion, application. We reviewed the parable of the wise and foolish builder and how it relates to the importance of application. We discussed the importance of discipleship. I cannot discuss or say in enough words how important discipleship is in our journey. We reviewed the components of the gospel message last time that we came together in which the Christians should place their faith in. I mean, I, I wish I could go back over that entire list, but if you guys missed any of it, the, these teachings are available on YouTube and on our social media um, uh, platforms. And then last week, uh, we also discussed uh, who Jesus should be to you. Again, you can't grow as a Christian and mature as a believer if you don't have a strong conviction about Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Yeah. So that's a, that's a huge component there that we talked about. Who do you say that I am? That was what Jesus posed to, to Peter and the disciples. And depending on how you answer that question, literally will determine how mature you will become in the faith. 
Uh, if you have a strong conviction that he is the Messiah, that he is the unique son of God, that he is your king, your master, your savior, then guess what? You're going to do whatever within your means, within your response, led by the power of the Holy Spirit to grow and to mature in the faith. And then we talked last week, discussed the importance of submission to Christ, submission to the gospel, submission to the discipleship process, the, uh, submission to the will of God, submission to the Holy Spirit and submission to others that will help you keep you accountable and encourage you on your journey to maturity. Praise the Lord. And so this week. Guess what we're going to talk about? We're going to go over real quick the program philosophy. Again, we want Ephesians 4 to be a memory verse for you. So then this way, when you're out and about and you come across certain situations, oh, I'm a believer, I'm a disciple, I'm a Christian, and I must respond in a way that's holy and pleasing in a mature way. we we'll talk a little bit about response the next couple of weeks. Uh, transform into that. We're going to talk about the, um, exploring the outcome of submitting to the will of God transform into the image of Christ. This is the outcome. When you submit to God's will, when you submit to the gospel, when you submit to the discipleship process, it should lead to your transformation into the image of Christ, conform to the image of Christ. And we're going to talk about these two biblical words here today. And then we're going to go over some examples of what transformation should look like, some worldly examples. I know uh, we like to kind of put it into perspective so we can connect the, the dots, uh, you know, and how that can relate to us. And then we'll discuss how a disciple can be transformed. It's always the how. So the purpose of this believers course, this Christian maturity course, is to show you how to follow Jesus how to become mature, how to become transformed. And we'll talk about the Holy Spirit as your helper. We talk about being converted, turning to God, your response, repentance, be sanctified by the word and through your obedience, okay? Sounds good? Yeah, and thank you guys so much for coming. I know it's late and I pray that you guys will bear with us. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter four. Again, just a memory verse. So Christ himself, from 12 to 13, gave the apostles. These are the gifts that Christ has given the church, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. I love that. Mature. That's our goal. That should be your spiritual goal, your Christian goal, to become mature in every area of your life. Paul encourages the church that he wants the church to be sanctified through and through, mind, body, and soul, and spirit. He, now our whole life should be sanctified, so that should be one of our goals, to become mature. And then he says this, this is the outcome when you become mature. Then you will no longer... Then you will no longer be tossed. Let's see here. Did it go? Okay. Tossed back and forth by the waves. When you become mature, now you'll be able to differentiate. We got some groups out here right now outside of the church that are preaching a contrary gospel. But if you didn't know any better, if you weren't growing, if you weren't maturing in the faith, then that could easily confuse you so quickly because you can't tell right from wrong. But when you become mature, uh, you will no longer be infants of the faith. You can't you won't be able to be tossed back and forth by the ways blown in here by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming and what they're trying to promote in their propaganda instead speaking the truth in love, because that's part of being a mature Christian. A lot of us speak the truth. But is it out of love? Is it out of gentleness? Is it coming from the right heart, from the right motive, from the right spirit? We will grow to become in every respect a mature body. If we do these things, if we apply the word, we will become that mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined, held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does his work. I know one thing where believers can do much better in that I see constantly as a hospice chaplain, and that's the area of death, death and dying. And when someone gets sick, when you get that, you know, stage four, a cancer diagnosis, and death is lurking around the corner or something tragic happens, 
one thing that goes out the door is our response, our holiness. We panic. You know, we, we, we get caught up in the emotion of certain things and we get scared and we're fearful and our response isn't mature and it's not where it needs to be. So part of this course here is teaching you guys how to respond, how to be led by the power of the Holy Spirit and how to control yourself, especially when you find yourself in situations, affliction, trials, circumstances. And we know that the disciples, as we talked about in Sunday's message, they they knew something when it came to dealing with affliction and how they were able to do it. They were being fed the wild bees. They were being crucified upside down. They were being martyred for the faith. They were being persecuted, tortured. I mean, I mean, barbaric forms of just uh, humiliating them. It's just it's just when you read the history of what some of these early Christians did and what they had to go through and how they remained faithful, that's my prayer for this body of Christ, even though we won't go through half of what they went through during that time. All right, so what is the outcome when we submit to these critical components of the Christian faith? You will bear fruit that will last. That's the outcome. I want to bear fruit. I don't know about you, but I want to bear fruit. I want to bear fruit in every season. I just don't want to bear fruit during certain during certain times of the year. I want to be able to bear fruit in every season. When things are going well, when things are not going well, I want to be able to bear fruit. And I pray that that's your goal as well. Jesus says, I, you didn't choose me. I chose you to bear fruit. But fruit, that's not just going to sustain for a certain period of time, but fruit that's going to last, fruit that's going to endure, fruit that you are going to exhibit no matter the circumstances you encounter in your life. You will, this is the outcome, you will begin when you submit to God's will, you will begin to fulfill the Lord's will in your life, which is to what? To become a mature believer in Christ who is equipped to go ye therefore and do good works and advance the gospel and the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. And when we submit to this, guess what? We will start to see this transformation, this transformation. And this is a word that we do find in scripture. In 2 Corinthians 3, 18, it says, and we all, and Paul is speaking to the church here, uh, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed. And the KJV, KJV says from glory to glory into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And when Moses went onto that mountain, when he came back, his glory was so radiant that he had to put a veil on his face. He, he went from one to another. So this is what being transformed into the image of Christ is really about, going from one to another. We'll talk a little bit about this. According to the Greek language, when it, this word transformation means to transfigure, means to change into another form. So part of being a mature Christian, when you become saved by his grace, the objective is to be transformed, to go from your old to the new, to transfigure. Christ's appearance was changed. Think about this here in Matthew 17 and was resplendent with divine brightness on the Mount of Transfiguration. So he also, in a sense, transformed before the disciples that were present there. And if you see here on the bottom of the Strong's definition, it means to metamorphose, metamorphose, to go from one to another, to transfigure, change, transform. So this is what transform, metamorph, and think about it. The English word that we have in our dictionary, metamorphosis, well, that comes from the, the Greek. Nothing in the English language is uh, originates in itself. The English language is borrowed from many other languages. And we know how uh, uh, difficult the English language can be when it comes to <laughs> just how it was formulated, all right? So, so this is what transform means. So here go one analogy of just what it should look like for a believer, an earthly analogy. The, the, the sanctification, in a sense, the transformation, that's the cocooning process. And as we continue to submit to the will of God and we continue to be transformed, we want to come out like that butterfly. So that should be our goal, to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And what is the goal for every Christian? Not only to become rooted, to become established, 
but it's also to be transformed, changed into the image of Christ. Now look at this first bullet here. It says, don't be deceived that becoming a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't require change. Now that's, that's, that, that's the gospel of the world that says, look, you don't have to change yourself. You don't have to in, undergo any type of transformation. God will accept you. And I do agree. God will, uh, you know, place his mercy and grace upon your life. But he doesn't say stay there and continue to live your old ways, your old life of sin. I know that we are come as you are, church. But as Elder Darius said in one of his first messages at Christian Way Ministries, and I loved it. We're not a stay as you are, church. We want you to come as you are. Because the what does it say? The hospital is not for the healthy, but for the sick. So the church is not for the healthy. It's literally, in a sense, for the sick. So we come in because we're all sinners in need of God's grace, in need of his mercy. And when he leads us by the power of the Holy Spirit, we should start to see some change, some transformation. Part of what it means to repent is to undergo a change in thought about your former lifestyle that will lead to a change in how you live your life. So following Jesus requires a change. I want you to do a self-assessment now. Like, look at you. Where was I a year ago? Where was I five years ago? Where was I 10 years ago? If you don't see no change there, then you know what? Something is not, something is not happening in here in your heart that's compelling you to change and to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. We have to constantly, like we talked about, in session two, examination. Examine yourselves. That should be something we do all the time, a constant practice. Maturity, in a sense, requires change. Simple. Somebody go get the door real quick. Maturity requires change. We can't get around it. We saw in the Greek language what Transform means to be changed, to transfigure, to be transformed. Christian maturity cannot occur without change. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. This alludes to what it means to be transformed, going from one to another, going from sinner to saint. And that's why I like to use the word saint when I address the believers at church, because you were once lost, but now you're found. You've undergone some type of change. Can't get around it. Look, Jesus answered him. Truly, I tell you in John 3, 3, I say, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We must be born again by water and by spirit. We must undergo a transformation. We must be sanctified. We'll talk a little bit about that too. We must change. I know when I look, <laughs> Brick can testify right now, I'm, I'm 11 years in and I'm constantly still, as I continue to minister the word, I'm constantly still undergoing change myself. I'm still trying to make adjustments and tweaks here and there, how I approach certain things, how I talk. You know, with certain people, it's, it's a constant evaluation, a constant desire of being purified and, 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 tra and being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Look, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51 through 52 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but, in, but we will all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of the eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. Now, this is speaking mostly in regards to the end times at the consummation of all things when it deals with the resurrection. But there's even change here. So just connecting the dots, every disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ must undergo change change in their mind, meaning their thought process, how they think about God, how they think about their sin, change in their actions, how they behave, how they move forward in conducting whatever in their life, change in their hearts, obviously, without change, 
at the seat of your existence, circumcision by the spirit in your heart. You cannot grow and become a mature believer and change in their body as 1 Corinthians 15 was alluding to at the consummation of all things. We will put off mortality and put on immortality. So there will be change even at the resurrection. So we can't get around it when it comes to the will of God for our life, for a Christian, for every disciple. Remember, Christian maturity will not occur overnight. So you have to be patient with yourself. Are you going to get it all right every single time? No, we will not. But as we continue to strive for perfection, we continue to strive to become mature and we continue to submit to the will of God, submit to the Holy Spirit. When we find ourselves doing something that may not be what God wants us to do, may not be exactly holy and pleasing unto his sight. When we hear that conviction in our heart, it's important for us to repent and to confess it and it's put in certain accountability measures so we don't duplicate the same mistake. This comes with maturity. This doesn't happen overnight. You don't come out the womb knowing how to do all of these things. These are things that we have to learn. Remember, even in Titus, at the end of the message last week, uh, this past Sunday, when it comes to devoting yourself to do good, he says you have to learn to do good. These are things we have to learn to do. God's not going to just wipe his wand and then you're just going to become perfect overnight. No, these are things that we have to apply. Christian maturity will not overcome uh, occur overnight. It is a process of becoming a full-grown Christian. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. We must be conformed. This is another biblical word here that we find in Scripture, in the English language. We must be conformed to what? This all connects together. So this is not a trick question. Romans 8, 28 through 29. We know that those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to what? His purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So when God elected you and he saved you by his grace, he saved you and he predestined you to be conformed, to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And when we talk about the image of Jesus Christ, we talk about his likeness. We talk about his attributes. We talk about his life and mimicking his life in order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. Part of Christian maturity is to be conformed. And it's similar to being transformed. And here in the original language, fashion like unto. Now in our world, in our day and age, we have a lot of people that we look up to. I don't know who that may be for you, but when I think about certain figures throughout history, like for me, I'm a pastor. So maybe, you know, I'm looking at Billy Graham or I'm looking at uh, Charles Stanley or I'm looking at, uh, you know, some of the other, you know, faithful men of God that have come throughout history. Oh, man, you know, I would like to be like such and such. Our overall objective is to be like Jesus. He is the epitome. He is the gold standard. He is what we should strive to be like in every area of our life. I love the WWJD question. What would Jesus do? When we find ourselves in a pickle, how often do we just take a time out, take a deep breath and say, what would Jesus do in this circumstance? And try to mimic that response. So to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ means to be fashioned like onto Jesus, having the same form as another similar to conform to. I like that. Conform to Christ and his word by the Holy Spirit, or are you conform to the patterns of the world? We have two categories. You're either going to be transformed into the image of Christ, conformed to his image, or you're going to be conformed to the patterns of the world. Conforms to co conform to the spirit of the Antichrist, because you know, guess what? The whole world lies under the power of the evil. So which one are you going to be conformed to? There's only two sides of a coin. I know we like to say that there's shades of gray here. Uh, some, some like to straddle the fence and still include themselves on the narrow road, but there's only two, either up or down. 
either east or west, all right? You either conform to Christ or you conform to the world. Look what Paul says here. Do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be conformed to the image of Christ by the renewing of your mind. Then, this is what happens. This is the outcome of Christian maturity. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. But you won't be able to do that if you're mimicking the world. You're mimicking the standards of the world. You're following after worldly things that stand contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You won't be able to test his will and see what's right, what's wrong, because you're following after the world. You're not following after God's word and his standards that he has set forth for his people. Praise the Lord. Every believer must be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ that occurs through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit in their heart that transforms their mind, which ultimately leads them to shed their old way of life and put on the newness of Christ. I know I was speaking to my brother about a certain situation, and I'm not going to name names, but their little ones weren't, you know, acting right. And <laughs> I will never forget that he said, well, because they have an unregenerate heart. <laughs> I was like, I was like, man, I have never heard anybody spin it that way. But I said, he's absolutely right. And I loved it. I was so weak. It was like, you know, and ne next time my kids act that way or I come across somebody, it's just basically they have an unregenerate heart and that's why they act the way they act. But when it comes to being a Christian, when it comes to being a mature believer, you have a heart that's regenerated. It's transformed. It's renewed. It wants wants to follow after the things of God and it sheds off the old life and puts on the new life of Jesus Christ. And so here we have a couple of examples, some worldly examples, again, just to connect the dots of what transformation is supposed to look like. For instance, look at this snake here. All right. Now the snake at a certain point of time, now I don't like snakes, but I know some people that keep snakes as pets, but over a period of time, what, what, what will the snake do? It will shed off its old skin and it will put on and it will have a new skin when it sheds off its old skin. So snakes do that. I, I love that. And another example is the crab. I didn't even know about the crab, but the crab also sheds off its shell after a certain period of time. And I, I don't know if you've ever seen it, you, maybe a Google it, a YouTube video, but it's a process that takes, you know, maybe 15, 30 minutes, but they just, they just continue to work at it, work at it. Next thing you know, psh, they completely, and at times they'll lose maybe a claw or two in the process, but they don't care because they'll grow it right back. And that's part of how they, you know, off their old shell. And because they, you know, they grow it. And that's the only way for them to grow. They got to get rid of the old skin in order for them to continue to grow. Some crawfish will shed its shell and go seek a bigger shell in order for them to grow. And this is somewhat like what it means to be a believer, a Christian. We want to grow. We have to shed off the old. If we don't shed off the old, then we're not going to grow. And at times we want to do what we want to do. But when it comes to discipleship, we have to remember that in order to grow in Christ, we have to deny ourselves. That's the only way. That's the key. Look at this. Think about this. Here are fun, fun facts for you. Humans shed their skin every day, naturally. And the process of skin renewal takes about 28 to 42 days. The body sheds about 30 to 40,000 skin cells per minute or nearly nine pounds per year. That's crazy, isn't that? But that's what the body, the body is constantly regenerating itself. Now, I wonder who put the code in our bodies to just do that. Okay, I won't go there, but I'm just saying. I, and I double check. I know that now we're in that age of artificial intelligence now. And so mm -hmm. this pulls that up. But I was able to double check this source here. But yes, our body sheds as well its own skin. And, you know, sometimes you'll scratch and you'll just say, it's microscopic. You barely see it. But over time, you shed your own skin. This is what a believer has to do. They have to shed off their old life. And I just love that the Lord led me to just put those few examples together to just give us an idea of what it means to shed off the old. Look, Ephesians 4.24, put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness 
and holiness. In order to put on a new self, what do you got to do? You got to shed the old self, your old ways, your old, you know, train of thought and how you used to think about God, his word, about the church or whatever it was. You know, those addictions, those those practices, those things that were not of God. We have to shed that. Romans 6, 4. This is what baptism, uh, it, what, what, what it symbolizes. Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, death to our own life. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life. So that's what baptism represents. It's a means that God used to show the believer what Jesus did on the cross and to demonstrate to the believer what we need to do moving forward as we live our life for God. We bury the old self. We bury our life of sin. We bury our old ways. And then in that same chapter, for we know that our old self was what? Crucified. Look at the language that he used, crucified, meaning what? <laughs> Crucifixion and the cross is a symbol of what? Yeah. It's a symbol of death. I know it looks pretty when we wear it on our around our neck, we wear it on our ears, we may wear it on our shirt, but let's not forget what it symbolizes. Capital punishment, torture, humiliation, death for sins. So he uses this language here to describe what we ought to do with our old way of life, our old self, to crucify with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we shall no longer be slaves to sin. Because why Jesus has come to set the captives free. Amen. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. And now where, where, where the spirit of the Lord is now, there is liberty. Why, there is, why is there liberty? Because we're no longer slaves to sin. We're no longer slaves to our old self. We have been regenerated. We have been made new. We have been transformed and conformed to the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. These are essentials in order for us to grow. And now we're going to get into the next segment where we talk about the hat. We talk about putting it into practice, things that we can do, our response. So I got a few things here that we're gonna discuss as far as the how, all right? And I can't, Jesus already set the standard, but in order for us to respond wholly and to respond and to be obedient and faithful to the things that God is calling us to do, we can't do this on our own. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is what? Our helper. He is our helper that will help us, empower us, equip us, convict us to do the things that we know we need to do in order to become the mature body of Jesus Christ. So it starts with the Holy Spirit, our helper. And remember, last week we talked about submission to the Holy Spirit, his conviction about sin, about righteousness, about judgment. That's why Jesus sent the power of the Holy Spirit to help us to be our advocate, to be our comforter, to be our guide, to teach us and remind us of all things as far as his truth is concerned. So I had to start there. John 14, 16, Jesus says, I will what? Ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. This is not a part-time partnership. This is an eternal partnership. And the Holy Spirit was given to help the disciple, the believer, to mature in the faith and to go and be a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll talk about mission a little bit down the line. Once the Holy Spirit, yes, ma'am. I'm so glad, Bishop, that, um, that you are making it plain that we can actually practice it in our life. Because I'm telling you, that's the reason why I was up a little bit today. My daughter had made me so angry. And I told you I was dealing with issues with my mouth. Yes. With the, uh, how God is delivering me from the words that I say that's not so nice sometimes out of my mouth. And um, the Holy Spirit, you're right, is our God. Because I was getting ready to say something to her when she made me angry right before class started on my way. And I said, you know what? I said, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, please help me to how to get into this child. And I'm about to let her have it. And he did. He intervened and he he came right on and said, Don't say that, don't say that. It'll be detrimental, don't say it. And I'm glad I listened to the Holy Spirit. So I thank God for these classes because they are practical to 
me putting it into my everyday life. And, and thank you, okay. Sister Dion, for your testimony because, again, can we see moments in our own life where we can look and say, oh, I'm growing. And that could be for you, encouragement to you that, yes, with God, these things are possible. As the Holy Spirit helps us and transform us, yes, we can live our lives holy, even in the midst of affliction when someone is trying to, you know, irritate your spirit, you know, yes, can we practice, you know, um, holiness? Can we be led by the power of the Holy Spirit? Can we manifest the fruit of self-control and control our tongue and the, and the and words that we say out of our mouth? Absolutely. And I appreciate that. Look, it says here, once the Holy Spirit convicts, you know, your heart to accept Jesus Christ, then what is your response to this grace of God? This is why I said in my sermon last week, the more we focus on God's grace, the more we focus on his mercy, the more we don't want to do anything that's going to disappoint our God. He's our savior. So that's why we have to have a heavy emphasis on the faith, a heavy emphasis on the hope, a heavy emphasis on what he did to save us. So then this way we can live our life according to his goodness. Conversion. We'll talk a little bit about conversion for a few minutes here. When it comes to our response, look at what um, Peter said in Acts chapter 3, 19. He says, repent. This is the command. Repent ye therefore and be what? Converted. Now we use the KJV here because the KJV uses this word converted. That your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So here go part of how we are to respond. First, repent. We'll talk about repent here in a few minutes. But conversion, being converted. And this word converted means to turn, to turn to God. Here we go, right here. This is what it means to be converted. This is the response. This is the action to turn, turn back to God, to the worship of the true God, to cause to return and bring back to the love and obedience of God, to the love for the children of God, to the love of wisdom and righteousness. So being converted means to turn, to do a 180, to go back to God. Um, it says here to turn oneself about the turn back to return all right and so this is what it means in the greek to convert to return um and i and i love that this is the action this is the response sister dion you said it when she tried to and you saw that you know you want your your response wasn't going to be what it should have been you turned away you turn right you turn back to god and say uh-uh Father God, help me respond wholly because what I don't want to do is repent later because I didn't control myself. You turn. So this is part of what it means to be converted. How? We're going over the how right now. Repentance. Repentance. Now we're going to be, some of this stuff may be a little redundant. Some of this stuff, I know that we, we so as far as the mature belief, those that have a good, uh, uh, you know, good knowledge of his word, some of this may be a little trivial, but repentance, I really feel that at times we can still grow in this area. This means to have a change in one's mind, to change one's mind for the better. That's what repent is, Go, you know, going towards the better, going towards the good, being transformed heart heartily to a man with abhorrence one past sins so you 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 just don't dislike it you hate it like i now i hate what i used to do and i don't have a desire to go back it says here repentance involves a turning being converted look at how all of this connects a turning with contrition from sin to god the repentant sinner is in the proper condition to accept the divine forgiveness. So when you repent in turn, you receive forgiveness. In turn, when you are baptized and you receive the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ, you then receive the free gift of the Holy Spirit who will continue to help you be transformed into the image of Christ. Look on the bottom here, the Strong's definition of repent, to think differently. Or afterwards, reconsider, morally, feel compunction, repent. And what does 
John the Baptist say here in the very beginning of the Gospel of Matthew? Produce fruit in what? Keeping with repentance. This is the how. This is the response. This is what we need to do in order to encourage Christian maturity. And I wanted to, and I, I want to see this is the first time I ever did this, but I want to see if I can pull up. Let me see. Will it let me do it here? I don't know if I can. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll direct your attention over here to the screen and I'll read part of this. Um, and this is what does it mean to produce fruit in keeping with repentance? And I, I like I like it here. It says in the second in the second chapter, it says John spoke severely challenging these religious leaders, spiritual pride and hypocrisy head on. They needed to know that God's judgment for sin was coming. Baptism is an outward symbol of true heart change. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Repentance is an act of changing one's mind that results in a change of actions. Sincere repentance involves, here we go, turning away, being converted from sin, both in thought and in action. And this is from GodQuestions.org. I apologize for those online that I can't pull it up right here. I should have tried to put that, try to figure that out before I started the course, but it's okay. I'm actually reading it to you all. And it says um, here, when the crowds came to John for baptism, they were showing their repentance and identifying with a new life. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you can go to gotquestions.org. And the title of this is what does it mean to produce fruit in keeping with repentance? We're teaching you the how. All right. Um, let's see here. So the believer's spiritual life and growth are often compared to a fruit bearing tree in scripture, being planted, being rooted. We talked about this in the first lesson. Just as fruit production is proof of life and death in a tree, so are good actions, the evidence of spiritual life in Jesus Christ and the presence of God's spirit dwelling within a person. Jesus said a good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is what? This is Jesus. This is what Jesus said. It's chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Matthew 7, 17 through 20. It says fruit in keeping with repentance represents the good deeds and change behaviors that naturally flow from a truly repented and transformed heart. James 2, 14 through 16 says faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless if it doesn't produce good deeds. So how can I really tell you're a believer? How can I really tell you're committed to the faith? I can just examine your fruit. Now that doesn't mean I can look down upon you or judge you or whatever as far as your eternal state, but you will know them by the fruit that they bear. So Christian maturity, when it comes to being a disciple of Jesus Christ, bears good fruit, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, and forbearance, patience. Absolutely. It says in the following, in the following, he gives examples of good spiritual fruit. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. And we just quoted those. The believer's ability to produce fruit in keeping with repentance depends wholly on our intimate fellowship with Jesus Christ, who said, remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. And Jesus says, yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. The root will naturally produce fruit. Fruit in keeping with repentance is the evidence as well as a result 
of a changed mind, transformed life, and ongoing communion with Jesus that is led by the power of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. And so now as I go back here to the presentation, God is good. God is good. Let's see. Did I, did I lose you here? Let's see. Not um, let me see. Can I? Sorry, you guys. My 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 screen is not. Uh, here we go. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So Acts twenty six twenty. Repent. Here it goes. All together. Turn to God. Being converted. All of it connects. Continuity is there. Performing what deeds. Consistent with what? Repentance. This is the how. Convert. Repent. Turn to God. Turn to his word. Submission. All of it goes hand in hand. Look, and this, this, this command to turn, this is rooted also in the Old Testament. Therefore, you Israelites, in Ezekiel 18.30, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent. Here we go. Turn away from all your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. They had the same command, turn to repent. So what we're talking about in the New Testament is not a new concept. This is rooted in the Old Testament. If my people love this verse, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and what? Turn, be converted from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Second Chronicles 7, 14. Look, Jeremiah 7, 3. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Reform your ways. Part of being conformed, part of being transformed is to be reformed. And your actions, and I will let you live in this place. This was a command to the nation of Israel. If they reform, if they turn, if they were converted, if they stopped worshiping other foreign gods, if they sought his face. And look how many times the word Turn is mentioned here in the Old Testament 1,066 times. So yes, they may not have had the Holy Spirit indwelling inside of their heart at the time, but they had the Word of God. And this Word encouraged them more than a 1,000 times to turn to God. It's there. Turn to return again, to turn back, away, restore, bring, render, answer, recompense, recover, deliver, put, withdraw. Look, this is what it means. To turn back to God, to turn away from apostasy, to repent. Look at the usage on this just one word. And it continues on. Look, this one word, it continues on. To show turning, to bring back, to allow to return, to refresh, restore, report to, answer, make requital. I was like, man, reverse, revoke, <laughs> reverse your sin, revoke your sin. So many ways. That um, this can be spent when it comes to just this one Hebrew word. Deterred. A thousand times. I mean, how important is that? And then Peter connects the dots. You know, you, you, you know, what did they have in mind? When Peter says, be converted, repent and be converted, he's thinking about the word. This was the word. This was embedded in God's word. So it wasn't something new. And so what's your response? I pray to turn so you can continue to grow in your Christian walk. That you can continue to be the true disciple of Jesus Christ that he wants you to be. So you can be transformed into his image and after his likeness. What is your response? Be sanctified for God. Be sanctified. You know what your response should be? Be sanctified means to be set apart. You have to set yourself apart from what? Profane things that don't honor God, that don't give him glory. You have to set yourself apart. You have to avoid certain things, certain life. Maybe at, at, in the beginning, you may have to avoid certain people Amen. until you can grow and be where you need to be in order to be around their company again. Yes. Right. Yes. You know, now yes. I can go, I can go yes. to a place now. Maybe they're engaging in a certain sin, 
But because of my mature walk in the Lord, now I can go into that environment and not be tempted to commit that sin. And this is what it, this is your response. You got to be sanctified. Now, this is not going to happen without the helper, the Holy Spirit. That's why I started off with him first, because he's going to help you do this. He will provide a way for you to escape. If you're listening, if you're truly submitting in your heart to the will of God and to the Holy Spirit, to be sanctified means to be purified, be free from the guilt of sin, to purify internally by the renewing of your soul, which happens through the regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Sanctification. Can't get around that. To render or acknowledge. To be vener uh, venerable or hollow. To separate from profane things and dedicate to God. To consecrate yourself. To dedicate yourself. We talked about devotion. Another word here. To dedicate. To cleanse externally from those things that you know that if you participate are going to corrupt you internally. Purify internally by the renewing of your soul. Be holy. Sanctify. Love that. How? We're continuing on this theme with the how. Sanctify them in the truth, for your word is truth. So one way we can be sanctified, one way we can be converted, one way we can continue to mature in our response is through the very precious word of God that was preserved for us. This is the reason why I'm even teaching this class today because of Jesus, because of the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of me and because of the preserved word that gives me all of the information that I need to teach this course. Without the word of God, how would I know about any of anything unless God spoke to me directly? But he spoke to those before directly. They preserved that word. And now we have access to it because God preserved it throughout the, the years, throughout the generations. So we can know it for ourselves. Meditate on the word day and night. You want to become a mature believer, you can't do it without meditating on the word. Be, being able to preach the word of God, being able to do these sessions, being able to uh, be an adjunct, you know, online at Liberty. All of these things give me opportunities to meditate on the word. I even, I order those devotions, the in touch devotion, the our daily bread, daily devotions. Why? Because each one comes with scripture. Mm -hmm. And that, if you are consistent with your practice and you're training yourself, then every day you have something, you set a, a particular time out of your day to get into the word, to memorize certain uh, verses of scripture that you know, the Holy Spirit will bring back into your remembrance when you're going to need it. Amen. But what is the Holy Spirit going to bring back into your remembrance if you're not taking time out to watch your day? What is your response? Your response should be meditating on God's word. Amen. Do not merely listen to the word. Here we go. So we meditate on it. And after we meditate on it, we do what it says. This is the how. We actually apply it. We put it into practice. We become a demonstration of that word. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away immediately and forgets what he looks like. Yep. That's, that's, the, that's the analogy that James gives to those that listen but don't do it. Nay, on the verge, you, you, if you don't apply the word, you'll never, you'll never grow as a believer. You'll never grow as a Christian. You have to do it. Oftentimes, will the word go against your flesh? Yes, it will. But this is why the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you empowers you and equips you to deny yourself, to repent and bear fruit and keep it with repentance, and to apply the word of God, especially during difficult moments that you're going to encounter in your life. James 121, therefore get rid of all moral filth. Separate yourself from anything that would corrupt you and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. It can. You will find yourself in a particular situation, but because you have dedicated yourself to God's word and meditating on it day and night, you come across a situation that's trying to tempt you to sin against your God. The Holy Spirit will bring back into your remembrance that word that you were just meditating on. But if you're not doing it, then guess what? It's not going to happen. How? The Bible is a very practical book, believe it or not. 
basic instructions before leaving earth. I love that because that's what it is. <laughs> so here, there's a great instruction in there. Matter of fact, I'm going to deviate a little bit here off, off the subject. Uh, just when it comes to the, to the instruction, look, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says in verse 2, I'm reading for the NIV, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes into God's will. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. That you should avoid sexual immorality. That you should learn, as Sister Dion pointed to in her testimony, to control your own body, your own tongue, in a way that's honor, holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not love God. And that in this manner, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. Because if you, if you do take advantage, the Lord will punish all those who commit such sins. And look, it says... And as we told you and warned you before, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this what? Instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. This is the how. Obedience. And I'm almost done. Obedience. Without obedience to the teachings, without obedience to the word of God, without submission to his will. There's no way you're going to be able to grow as a Christian. You have to you have to put off the old and you have to put on the new. Submit to the Holy Spirit, submit to the word of God, submit to the discipleship process, submit to the gospel message. Submit yourself to others who are where you are striving to be. Those that are true men and women of God, the church of Jesus Christ. That's here to, to help you and to encourage your Christian walk. Acts 5.32, we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit who God has given to those who obey him. So he's not going to give the Holy Spirit to those who are constantly living their lives in disobedience. Oil and water can't mix together. We have to remember that the Holy Spirit, look at this, it says who. We talked about who the Holy Spirit was last time we came together. Who? Who is a person whom God has given those who obey him. So God gives us the Holy Spirit to reside inside of us, to help us, to encourage our walk, to grow our faith. But he's not going to give it unless you obey have to obey. Look at this quote here from Oswald Chambers. Spiritual maturity is not reached by the passing of the years, but by obedience to the will of God. Some people mature into an understanding of God's will more quickly than others because they obey more readily. The more readily sacrifice the life of nature to the will of God. So maturity can, it, a lot of people think the older you get, the more mature you're going to become. I come across a lot of people that are older than me that at the end of the day need to be in this class. <laughs> okay, I'm just saying, just because you're old doesn't mean you're mature. So maturity is not defined by your age or defined by how old you are. It's defined by the fruit that you bear. It's defined by your obedience, all right? That's what it's defined by. And I pray that that will be defined in your life. One second, Sister um, yes, Dion. Yes, One second. All right. Um, and outcome. This is the outcome if we apply these things. The outcome. The outcome is Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is the law, is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. This is the outcome. Spiritual maturity, spiritual success. Yes, will it come with some physical success as well? Absolutely. That will look different for every person because success is in the eye of the beholder. But at the end of the day, you will prosper. You will be like that tree that buds fruit every season, not just some seasons. This is the outcome. 
the outcome is, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all these things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. This is the outcome. When you find yourself in a particular situation, the Holy Spirit will remind you because he's actually dwelling inside of you. And because you are a doer of the word, you're meditating on his word day and night. So when you come across a certain situation, you'll be minded. Oh, yes. Thank you, Lord, for that. I needed that, especially with what I'm going through right now. Again, as a hostage chaplain, what is the word that continuously reminds me in the, at the end of life? Well, the resurrection and the life. Jesus is our eternal hope. This is not the end of the, wor uh, of the world or of the road. So when I go into the situation, I'm bringing them eternal hope. Well, because that person believed, because they have faith, guess what? They are now free from their suffering, from the pain, from the disease, from whatever it was that they were going through because they love the Lord. And now their bodies will be resurrected. Their bodies will undergo a change too. Praise the Lord. So this is the message. This is what keeps me going. This is what the Holy Spirit reminds me when I go into these type of situations without me meditating on the word. Guess what? Okay, this is the outcome. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Okay? Some of them were caught up in all kind of lifestyles. And he says, but, so, but some of you, this was what some of you were. But now the outcome is once you have repented, once you have received forgiveness in the power of the Holy Spirit, and now you're being conformed and transformed into the image of Christ, now you are being sanctified. You are justified in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the outcome of this. This is the outcome. Once the Holy Spirit leads you to accept Christ, to turn back to God, and to repent of your sins, he will take you on a journey of transformation through the Word of God that will lead you to becoming a mature Christian. This concludes the fourth session on Christian maturity. Let us pray. Father God, again, we thank you so much for our time together this evening. I thank you, Father, just for being able to teach again on what it means to become a mature believer. And so, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have preserved us so we can understand what it means to become transformed, to turn back to you, to bear fruit and keep it with repentance, and how you sent the Holy Spirit, Father God, as a helper, as an advocate, Father, to teach us and to remind us of your word, of this great gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Father, as we leave here today, but never away from your presence, Father, I pray, Lord, that as we go about our night and, you know, as we wake up in the morning, Lord willing, Father God, and we find ourselves in whatever situation we find ourselves in, Father, that we can continue continue to grow in our response, grow in our behavior, grow in the fruit of the Spirit, and just grow in our relationship with you, Father. I pray that our goal, our ultimate goal, Father, is to become a mature Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ, Father, who lives their lives holy and honorable and pleasing onto your sight. So, Father, we know that the enemy is out to seek, kill, and destroy, but, Lord, we pray that we will put on the whole armor of God, that we will pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God so we can withstand every while of the devil that's trying to destroy us and try to knock us off our journey uh, in our relationship with you, Father God. So again, we love you and we thank you so much for taking the time out, Lord, to teach us, Father, what it means to become a mature believer. So Lord, I pray for all those that are present here today. I pray, Lord, that you will continue to reward them according to their faith. I pray for all those that will receive this teaching online. And Father God, that it will encourage us and inspire us, Father God, to become mature. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all. God bless you all.